Probably like you, I've had a lot of jobs over the course of my life that have been challenging, interesting, and uh, difficult. Uh, the summer that I turned 16, some of you know this, but probably many of you don't, but the summer that I turned 16, uh, my dad made me get a job. And not only did my dad make me get a job in, in the period of time after school was out, before football began, not only did he make me get a job, but he chose my job. And, and my dad made me get a job on a road construction crew laying asphalt that summer. And that meant that I had to meet my foreman for the crew that I was working on. I had to meet him at Dairy Queen, or as we said in Middlesbrough, the Dairy Queen. You had to meet at the Dairy Queen at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, and then we would drive about an hour across Clinch Mountain over to the foot of Clinch Mountain and Bean Station, and so if you've ever driven on that nice highway in Bean Station alongside the lake, you're welcome. And uh, so I, I was there when that sucker was being built, and, and we wouldn't get back home at the end of the day until basically it was almost dark. And so it, it was not only a job, but it was, it was a job. Uh, that summer, I shoveled gravel. Uh, for hours on end, I shovel, uh, shoveled asphalt. Uh, uh, for hours on end, I hop tubs, and if you don't know what that means, then <laughs> you don't want to know what it means, especially if you got a good greater man behind you. And I did everything else uh, that Euless, my foreman, my fearless leader, my captain, everything that he told me to do, my job was to do it. I was, you heard of the totem pole? I was the low man at the bottom of the totem pole. All the while, it was hot as actual hell while we were doing it. And, and, and not only in the throes of summer, but you got the temperature of the asphalt. I mean, <laughs> it was something. And I think it accomplished what my father wanted it to accomplish. I'm not sure, but uh, it was good. I, I look back on it now and I can smile. I couldn't do that until after therapy, but uh, I, I can do that now. Uh, then I was a Subway sandwich artist for a while. Yeah. I, I, you probably didn't know that or see that coming. And, and it wasn't a great experience, though. It was probably a valuable experience because, you know, when you're behind the sacred desk of sandwich making, uh, you learn a lot of things about people. You learn that people are picky. Uh, a lot of times they're demanding. And none of these people are you, obviously, but picky, demanding, unreasonable, rude, snarky, uh, basically just ridiculous. Uh, uh, that's a lot of people. And, and, you know, that was my time at Subway. And looking back, it was really kind of a preparatory school for ministry. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, but again, not you. Uh, it, it's all those other Christians out there. And then I was a student pastor uh, for a bit, and, and that was fun, kind of. And it's kind of likened unto herding cats or turtles. Uh, that's what it's like to be a student pastor, and, and you're trying to get a group of people at a season of their life when it's not easy to, to lead and to herd. And, and that was fun. We had an open house policy Alice and I did uh, when we were leading the student ministry. Uh, and we had kids at our house from, from all hours of the day. I mean, literally from the morning until night and really in the middle of the night, we've had kids show up at our house two and three o'clock in the morning knocking on the door uh, because they're in crisis or some terrible thing had happened to them. And, and that was kind of, kind of our life. We didn't have kids at that point, but yet we had a lot of kids at that point. And, and student pastoring was a, was a great job, but it was not an easy job. It's one I'm thankful for. Now, I, I'm pastor and we have one church, but yet we're in four different locations. Uh, those of us in uh, London this morning, then those of you in Somerset and Middlesbrough and Williamsburg, and we have staff at each one of those churches. And what we do at one church, we do at all the churches. Uh, we have a lot of people who call the Creek Church uh, their church. And uh, so we try to take care of all the people as best we can uh, uh, that call this church their church. And then we're always trying to reach the people who aren't here yet that don't call this church their church, and, and we're trying to reach people who are far from God and far from faith, and, and there's just no one right way to do that, so we're always trying to figure out what's the best way to do that at the current season that we're in. And, and then in ministry, uh, you're always hearing about, you know, what's going on in people's lives, and it's almost, you know, when you're hearing about it in the ministry, it's almost always bad. Uh, so you hear stories about a lot of pain and a lot of sickness and a lot of death and a lot of just just stuff that, that life throws at us all, but 
but being in ministry, it's kind of hard to, to get away from that. You can stop watching cable news. You can stop reading the newspaper. But in the ministry, you just can't get away from bad news. It just, it just follows you. It's the nature of, of what we do. And uh, being in ministry is also, it's been my experience at least, it's, it's one of those jobs where you never feel like you're really ever doing a great job at it because there's always something that could be done better. Hey, you already knew that. There's always stuff around the church that could be better. There's always someone who needs to be checked on. There's always somewhere to be. So, you know, it's part of a job that a lot of people can't relate to. And, and I know your job is challenging as well, and I'm not making mine out to be any different than yours, but, but there, there's hardly ever a sense of being complete, completed or done or finished uh, because Sunday's always coming, Sunday's always coming. There's always stuff going on with people. And, and sometimes there's just not enough hours in the day to keep up with it all, though you really, really want to. And, and so those are just some of the jobs that I've had, but today I, I want to talk about maybe the hardest job that I've ever had, and it may just be the hardest job that I ever will have, uh, and I think also it's the most important thing, or one of the most important things that I will ever do, and, and I think that probably the same is true for you as well, and it's parenting. I really do think, uh, I think this is the hardest job that I've had up until this point. And, and looking forward, it's hard for me to imagine a more difficult job than this. Uh, I also believe that this is gonna be and is one of the most important things that I will do in my life. And if you are a parent, I want you to listen to me. One of the most difficult jobs that you will ever have in your life, maybe the most difficult job that you will ever have in your life is this right here, it is parenting. And it's also one of the most important things, and for some of you, it will be the most important thing that you will ever do in your life is parent a son or a daughter. It's parenting the children that God has given you. And because this is a very difficult job and because it's one of the most important things we'll ever do, we're gonna spend the next couple of weeks in what I'm calling a little mini-series, a two-week mini-series called What Happens at Home Doesn't Stay at Home because as parents, we raise our kids at home to get them out of the home one day. Can I get a witness? All right, we raise our kids at home to get them out of the home one day. But here's the thing, what happens in those years at home won't stay at home. What happens at home doesn't stay at home because your kids that you raise at home will one day have their own home. And what happened in your home will show up in their home. And one day your children God willing, we'll have grandchildren. And what happened in your home that showed up in your children's home will show up in your grandchildren's home. So what happens in your home, whether it's the kids that you raised once upon a time, whether it's the kids you're raising right now, the kids that have left home, I promise you, whatever stage of life you're in, what happens at your home, in your home, will not stay at home. And that's why we're gonna talk about it uh, for the next couple of weeks. A couple of disclaimers, though, before we do. Uh, first, I'm not someone who considers uh, himself to be a great parent. I really, really don't. I don't consider myself to be a great parent, but I will tell you this, I promise you, I promise you this, I do want to be a great parent. I want to be a great dad. I wanna be a great parent, like you do. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, I, I don't think there's another area in my life that I second guess myself as much as I second, second guess myself when it comes to being a dad or being a, a parent. I, I really don't. There, there, I second guess myself a lot. Uh, I, there's lots of areas, lots of areas in my life that I don't measure up, that I need to measure up in. But, but one of the areas where I just chronically just question, am I doing enough? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it enough? Doing it enough? You know, doing enough? Am I doing it right? The, over and over and over and over again is, is parenting. Uh, when I was thinking about this a few weeks ago and praying about this series and writing about it and studying for it, I wrote down in my, my journal one day that really for me, and I don't know if this is true for you, but for me, two of the greatest emotions uh, that I feel in parenting, and Shepherd's 12, he, he's over here, Grayson's nine, he's in Kids Creek right now. Um, two of the greatest emotions that I have in parenting thus far has been this right here, gratitude and helplessness. Now, I don't know if, if you feel the same, maybe you don't, maybe you should be up here today, but gratitude and helplessness. Uh, th there's a sense of, hey, you know, I've got a gratitude for being a parent and I've got this sense of helplessness for being a parent. Um, I I'm grateful to be a dad, I'm grateful to be a father. I love being a dad to Shepherd and, and Grayson. I know Allison feels that way as their mother. I know that you feel that way about your kids. My kids, like your kids, they bring me a lot of laugh, a lot of joy, a lot of smiles. 
smiles. Uh, that said, the only emotion that I can think of in this season that rivals my emotions of gratitude uh, are my feelings of helplessness that I have in parenting. Um, because here, here's what I'm talking about. A lot of times in parenting, see if I, uh, I'm you know at least in the same boat with you. A lot of times when you're a parent, you're not sure if you're doing the right thing or not. And that can be a difficult place to be in. You're just not sure if you're doing the right thing because you're not even sure what the right thing actually is. You're not sure about the right decision. You're not sure about what the right approach is. And because of it, you're left in this, this helpless you know, limbo. You're just not sure. You wanna do the right thing, but you're just not sure. And that brings about a sense of helplessness. At times as a parent, you're weighing the short term against the long term. And if what I'm doing in the short term is gonna make a difference for the good in the long term and, and doesn't even matter and how does the two match up and, and to try to figure that out can bring about a sense of helplessness. Uh, sometimes you gotta measure as a parent your level of needed protection because you're a parent, you're supposed to protect your children. And so you're trying to measure, you know, how much protection do I bring to this versus how much of an opportunity do I take or give them to grow in their own personal responsibility? You know, do I protect or do I give them, you know, uh, enough rope to grow their own responsibility? And where does my protection start and stop? And where does their sense of growing personal responsibility begin and end? And, and that can bring about a sense of helplessness because there's not, a, there's not a manual that gives us what to do in every situation type of book that we can open up. Uh, parents wrestle with, or at least I have, about creating order. Uh, for their children while still giving their kids enough chaos uh, and enough freedom to live according to their own bents and their own gifts because my two sons are very different from one another. They're alike in a lot of ways, but they're different in some very significant ways. And so giving them enough freedom to be their own person and not trying to make them clones, you know, of just one, you know, caricature or a clone of their mother or a clone of their father, but to allow them to, to live their life with their own individual bents and giftingness, uh, being able to be expressed. That's a difficult place to try to figure out. Uh, parents wrestle with the difference between controlling their kids and coaching their kids. And that's an important distinction to be made. I know a lot of parents who are completely, you know, satisfied with a, an approach that is about controlling their kids, controlling their kids, controlling their kids, controlling everything about their kids' lives, uh, even after their children have left home. Uh, that's one way, but I don't think it's the best way. Coaching uh, your children, calling the play, letting them learn how to run the play, and then critiquing them when they mess up the play so that one day they'll be able to run the play the way they're supposed to run the play. That seems like a much better approach approach and knowing how that all works itself out, that can be a bit helpless feeling. Uh, you don't want to see your kid hurt. I mean, one of the worst, most gut-wrenching feelings in all the world is seeing your son or your daughter hurt. I mean, it's just terrible. But yet, at the same time, it's our responsibility to help our children grow emotional resilience. So you got to let them hurt. You got to let them fall. You got to let them fail. And, and trying to figure when the right time is and when the right time isn't, it can all lead to a little bit of helplessness. So trying to get this right or trying to figure out if you are doing it right can make a person feel helpless because you're raising a kid all the while you're living your life. And you should maintain a life as you raise your children. You should maintain your marriage as you raise your children. So as you're living your life, trying to make a living, trying to deal with all that life throws at you as an adult, you're doing it trying not to screw up the son or the daughter that God has given you. And, and so that comes with a lot of pressure and it comes with a lot of responsibility. And that's why I say with those two emotions of you know, uh, gratitude and helplessness, there's really two prayers that are attached to it. Thank you and help me. That's the two prayers of a parent, or at least I, that's my prayer, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, help me, help me, help me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Help me, help me, help me. And if you maybe get nothing else out of the next you know, couple of weeks, maybe just start there. That's a great prayer for every parent. God, thank you that I get to be a parent to my son or my daughter, and God, help me to be a parent to my son or my daughter. Now, second thing is a disclaimer is this. Uh, this is just not for biological parents or adoptive parents or one day want to be a parent uh, type folk. Uh, this is about you know anybody who wants to shape or influence the future. This is for grandparents, for great grandparents, if you are at the stage of life that you even have great grandkids. Uh, for anybody who's interested in shaping or influencing the future, 
Anybody who cares about the next generation of men and women who are going to become parents and teachers and leaders and coaches and politicians, uh, if you care about the next generation any at all, this series is really for you as well because parenting and mentoring are a fundamental opportunity to directly influence the future. So if you're a coach, if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're a small group leader, you have a fundamental opportunity to directly influence the future. And the way that you do that is through the lives of those who are coming behind you. Uh, the lives of the people who are part of the next generation. Because whenever you or I take a keen interest in our own children or somebody else's children, we're actively involving ourselves in the process to change and influence what the future may actually look like. And, and then here's the last thing I wanna say before we just jump in head first. When it comes to parenting, parenting is not emotionally neutral. So everybody who's a parent has deep-seated opinions about what it means to be a good parent. Sometimes those are founded, sometimes they're unfounded. But I'm not gonna tell you how to raise your kid because that's not my role and I don't have the moral authority to do that. But what I will tell you and remind you is this. Somebody reminded me of this before I became a parent and this is what they reminded me of. Every significant thing you do in your life, you had to learn how to do. You had to learn how to walk, you had to learn how to talk, you had to learn how to feed yourself, you had to learn how to read, you had to learn how to write. Why would you ever just believe that you know without ever learning how to be a great parent? Being a great parent is not intuitive. Being a great parent is just not something we wake up one day and find ourselves being. We have to learn how to parent. We have to learn how to raise sons and daughters to become men and women. We have to pay attention. We have to ask questions. We have to follow other people's examples. We have to learn from people's successes and learn from their failures. So it doesn't matter whether your kids are at home or your kids are gone. It doesn't matter if you're a parent or grandparent. You're never too old and you're never too young to learn how to parent or mentor better. You're just not. It's a skill to always sharpen. It's a skill to always hone. Because here's the thing. Some of you, I'm not sure if you know this and not sure if you've been reminded of this. You never stop being a parent. You never stop being a mom or a dad. You're, that's who you are. And as long as your children are living and breathing, you're a mom and you're a dad. That relationship evolves. That relationship changes. It has to by necessity. But you never stop being a parent. You never stop being a mom. You never stop being a dad. So I want to talk about today, just for a few moments, about what I think is one of the most important things that us parents can learn how to do for our children. It's one of the most important things that you can do as a grandparent. It's one of the most important things you can learn to do as a teacher or as a leader of any kind, a coach, a small group leader. Listen, one of the most important things that we can learn to do in the lives of people who are coming behind us is we must learn how to cast a compelling vision. Uh, th this is one of the most, I think, overlooked and talked about parts of parenting. Uh, when, when we first became parents, you know, somebody gave us, you know, a whole set of books called Baby Wise, and then there was Toddler Wise, and then there was Adolescence Wise, and, 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 and then it was, you know, there's a whole thing of books, and it was all about, you know, feed times, and sleep time, and nap time, and self-soothing, and all of that, which was really good, and really important, and, and really helpful. But not a lot of people talk about how to cast a compelling vision when it comes to our sons and daughters. And I think that this may be one of the most important thing because this means that parents have to learn, us parents have to learn how to be far-sighted in our parenting, far-sighted rather than just nearsighted. There's a lot of nearsighted parenting that takes place in the 21st century West, which may be part of the problem for why we are producing the type of men and women that we're producing in the West in the last couple of generations because parenting has shifted in many ways, in a fundamental way, and it's become much more nearsighted. And nearsighted parenting leads to helicopter parenting, and it leads to controlling parents, and, and it, just, it, it just hardly ever leads to anything good. When only someone parents with, far, with nearsightedness. Because it's so easy, you, you know this already, it's really easy to get caught up in reacting what's already happening in real time. And it's really easy to just parent based on what's happening this week or next week or next month or even at the furthest out next year. And it's really easy as a mom or really easy as a dad just to get nearsighted and, and to think about, hey, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and we're gonna get this done and we're gonna learn this and we're gonna learn that. And, and it's all about this exam or this grade or this season or this problem or this relationship or this deal or this choice. And it's all about what's happening in the moment or what's happening in the next few days. Now, as a parent, that is part of our job. 
to be nearsighted. But it's also a big part of our responsibility to be farsighted, to think about our kids the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. That's part of our responsibility as well. It's to consider the lifetime of our children. And it's our responsibility as moms or dads, at least I believe it's our responsibility as moms, as moms and dads, to communicate a compelling vision over the lives of our kids, to deposit that vision into the hearts of our kids to speak over the future of what we pray and what we hope the future of our kids looks like. Now, there's a verse that you've heard probably quoted hundreds of times out of the Bible, and maybe you didn't even know where it was found, but it's Proverbs 29, 18. But I wanna read this verse to you and I want you to hear it uh, through the ears of parenting or mentoring. Listen to what Solomon said. He says, where there is no vision, the people what? Talk to me. Perish. Uh, well, that was very half-hearted. Where there is no vision, the people what? Perish. Perish. Now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, if you're, if you're taking seriously what you're reading, and, and not everybody takes the Bible seriously, but if we're taking the Bible seriously, you're taking the scripture here seriously, automatically, the, the wise writer, Solomon, he says, listen, this is a matter of life and death. Now, if somebody sat you down and said, listen, I need to talk to you about your kid, and it's a matter of life and death. You know what they're gonna have? Our undivided attention. Our heart's gonna skip a beat, our stomach's gonna turn, and you're gonna look into my face and you're gonna tell me something that is about life and death for my kid. The, the son, the daughter that I just love more than I know how to tell you that I love them. And you're gonna say, listen, I need to talk to you about something that is a matter of life and death. You're like, oh my God, okay, what is it? And Solomon says, it's a vision. That without vision, there's death. That where there's no vision, children, sons and daughters, grandchildren, they perish. There's lifelessness. He says, this is how serious this is. Uh, the NASB says it this way. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. With, without vision, Solomon says, there's no restraints on life. There's no guardrails. There's no anchors. There, there's nothing that ties us to things that are important or stabilizing or transcendent. He says, where there's no vision, there's just unrestrained living. There's just unrestrained choices. There's just unrestrained behavior. Now, any good parent knows that an unrestrained son or daughter, a child that's just free to do whatever they want, whenever they want, with whomever they want, that's not good. That's not healthy, that doesn't end well. So without vision, people just have no restraints. The Christian Standard Bible says this, where there's no revelation, a revelation of the future, where, where the curtain is not pulled back so the future can possibly be imagined or envisioned, people run wild. You've been around kids before that didn't belong to you and you've looked at your spouse and like, God, we gotta get out of here, they're just going wild. These kids are wild. They're like an untamed horse. They're like a bull in a china shop. I want to choke them. I will get arrested if we don't leave here soon. They're just running wild. Now, listen to this. Listen to this counsel through the ears of being a mom or a dad or a grandparent or a mentor or a coach or a leader or a teacher. God says through his word that without a vision for their future, children will lack life. Something in their life perishes. Something in their life dies. Something is extinguished. When children have no vision for their future, they live with less restraint. They have no anchors. They run the risk of running wild. So he says, you gotta be able to tell a compelling vision to your children. You gotta be able to speak a compelling vision over your children. You gotta be able to do this because it infuses your sons and daughters with a sense of life. It offers them an anchor that keeps them restrained in a cultural shifting sea of values and morality. It provides them the motivation that they need to be self-controlled in a world that celebrates autonomy and self-indulgence. Solomon's point can't be mistaken. Being able to speak a vision over somebody else's life, it is powerful. And as a parent, it is a responsibility that we should not and dare not neglect because the implications are clear. Where there's no vision, there's chaos and disorder. 
That's what ensues. Chaos and disorder. Everybody knows someone's lives. We all know what our lives have looked like from time to time, from season to season, where it got chaotic and it got disordered. And the reason that life gets chaotic and disordered for me or chaotic and disordered for you, it's when we lose a clear, compelling vision for our own future. The same thing happens to our children. Their lives get chaotic and disordered when they don't have a clear, compelling vision for what the future could look like. When people don't have a vision, they, they end up making short-term decisions at the expense of long-term benefits. When people lack a vision, they fail to see the correlation between today's choices and tomorrow's consequences. When we cast a vision for our kids, when we cast a vision for our grandkids, it paints a picture of a preferred future. What we're saying to our sons and daughters, what we're saying to our families, what we're saying to other folks is, look at this future that is to be preferred. Look at this, this is better. This is better. This is what good looks like. This is what better looks like. This is what best looks like. This is a future that could be for you. And this is a future that should be for you. And when you do that as a mom and dad, this is what it does. It creates a target. You're creating a target for your kid to aim at. You're creating a target for your kid to pursue. And not only are you creating a target, but you're raising the bar. It's establishing expectations. It's providing motivation. And it's instilling perseverance in your kid. And if you need a Bible reference for this, just jot down in your Bible, Joseph, or in your notes, Joseph. Because Joseph had a vision for his life as a teenager that God had spoken over his life, that his grandparents were a part of, that his grandfather was a part of, his great-grandfather was a part of. And there was this great vision that he had for his future. And when all hell broke loose in his life, and when the bone crushing pain of life knocked at his door, because it knocked at his door, and guess what? We don't want to think about it, but the bone crushing pain of life will knock at our children's door. And when it does, they need to have a compelling vision for the future that allows them to continue to move forward when it would be easy to quit and to check out and go a different way. So this is important. This is a big deal. Now, the psalmist. This, is one, this has been one of my favorite verses since I've been a dad. Uh, I, I've held on to this. I, I, I think about this quite often. But the psalmist, he uses the same imagery, but, but in a very different way. The same theme, the same idea. Listen to what he says in Psalm 127. He says, children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring, a reward from him. Let me just ask you a question. Everybody that's a parent, he's saying that children are a gift. If you believe that to be true, say I do. They are, they're a gift. He says, they're a heritage from the Lord. And then listen to this, he says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. That's you, you're a warrior. You're a warrior. That's who you are as a mom and dad. He says, go to war with this image. You are a warrior. And like an arrow in your hand, that's the parent-child relationship. Now he says, your, parent, your, your children are a gift, they're the legacy of your influence. That's where he starts. And that's a good place to just start thinking for a moment. That your children, they're gonna be the legacy of your influence. Because after you're dead, your influence will live on through them. Your words will live on through them. Though you're dead, yet you will be speaking through them and even to them. Because some of you know this. Your parents have been gone for years, but what do you still hear from time to time? The voice of your mother. The voice of your father. The face of your mother. The face of your father and it lives on in you. And you've spoken those words to your children and it continues to live on. So it's the legacy of your influence. And it's a reminder, it's a good reminder, it's a sobering reminder that what we do and what we say as moms and dads will echo into the lives of our children for the rest of their lives. In another Psalm, and this is even more sobering to think about, in another Psalm, the Psalmist says, hey, at any given time, when you are influencing your children, at the same time, in a very real way, you are influencing three generations in that moment. You're influencing the life of your kids, of your son or your daughter. You're influencing the lives of their children and their children. 
So not only are you influencing the life of your kids and your grandkids, but you're influencing the lives of your great grandkids by simply speaking into the lives of your son and your daughter in the moment. And in the moment, it is so hard to think about that. It is so hard to keep that frame of reference, but this is what the psalmist says. They are a heritage, they're a gift. They are the living on of our influence. What we do, what stays, what begins at home doesn't stay at home. There'll be an echo, there'll be a ripple. And he says, they're like arrows. And in those days, you know, you, you, don't, you didn't buy arrows. What did you do? You forged them, you shaped them, you, you, you make them, you invested time into making this arrow. You sharpened them yourself. That, that's what you did. Why? To shoot that arrow, because you're a warrior. To shoot that arrow at something important, at a worthy target. Target worth hitting. And, and here's the thing I'll, I'll mention in a minute. You shoot them at worthy targets, whether or not you yourself hit those targets at their season of life. You you shoot them at worthy targets, regardless of what your story has been, regardless of what your experience has been, regardless of what your family of origin was like. And here's the thing about arrows. They go in the direction they're aimed in. That's vision casting. Vision casting is finding worthy targets. And it's casting a vision in the direction of those worthy targets. And as moms and dads, listen to me, the last thing, the last thing we wanna do is shoot weak arrows at wrong targets. That's the last thing that we wanna do. God, help us not to shoot weak arrows at wrong targets because we will regret it for the rest of our lives. To raise a weak arrow and shoot it at a wrong target and for it to actually hit a wrong target We'll live to regret it. We're called to raise strong arrows that are aimed at worthy targets and it's our job to do the aiming. That's our role as moms and dads. It's our role to do the aiming because what matters is that they hit worthy targets, just not a target, but a worthy target. So what you raised an honor student? If they can't deal with life, what good was all of that work? If they were straight A's, straight A's and B's, but yet they can't handle when life is upsetting to them or they can't handle when they're disappointed or things don't work out their way, they just decompensate. What what good has there been that's been accomplished? So what they won most of their games and became one of the greatest athletes, but after the games are over and after sports are over, they have no ambition to do anything great in life or to win at life itself. So what, they got the job and they made a lot of money and they are making a lot of money, but they lost their faith somewhere along the way. What good have we actually accomplished? Arrows tend to go in the direction they're aimed. And as parents, it's our job to aim our arrows in a worthy direction, to cast a compelling vision for why they should go that way. Now, somebody told me Uh, before I became a parent. And it's something that I think it's worth repeating. The goal of parenting is not raising good kids, but it's raising great adults. That's the goal. So what, you raise a good, good, good kid, but not so great of an adult. Because a good kid doesn't always become a great adult. Maybe a parent was controlling. Maybe the parent made all the decisions. Maybe the parent was helicoptering all the time in every situation, making everything work out, manipulating the situation, controlling the outcomes. Just because they were a good kid doesn't mean they're gonna be a great adult. Aim for being a great adult. That's a target to shoot for. That's what vision is all about. It's about a worthy, worthy target. Now, I'm gonna give you just, just some verses that you can go back and read on your own. I think it's a great example of what it looks like to cast a compelling vision. It's found in the book of Proverbs and it's Proverbs chapter four. And I want you to see and listen to what this sounds like in real time. This is what, this is what Solomon says. He says, my children, he's talking as a parent, listen to when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment. For I am giving you good, adv- good, giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions. So this sounds like advice. That, that's vision. You're advising them in a direction. You're, you're painting a picture of the future. Listen to the heart of this, of this dad. He says, listen to me, pay attention to me. Learn good judgment so that you'll make good choices because your choices will create your future. And the most important thing for your future is to learn how to create, you know, learn how to make good choices in the moment because they'll pay off in the long run. 
He says, I'm here to give guidance. I'm here to give coaching. I'm here to cast a vision because he understood that was his responsibility. Parental guidance is required for all of us. We're to guide, we're to coach, we're to cast vision. That's what we're called to do. That's our responsibility. This is, this is a great parent in real time, what we're listening to right here. Because he's teaching his children what they should be persuaded to do. He's not trying to make them do it. He's not trying to make his son or daughter do this. But he understands it's much more powerful to learn how to persuade your kids when it would be easy just to make your kids do some things. Don't be content with just making your kids do some things. Learn and do the extra work to persuade them to do the things that they may not even wanna do. That's what he's doing, he's persuading. He says, for I too, was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands and you will live. He's quoting his father. What, what happens at home doesn't stay at home. He heard this in his father's house, in the home that he grew up in and now in his home, he's looking into the eyes of his own children and he's saying the same things that he heard. And the influence of the grandfather is being echoed into the lives of the grandchildren. And this is beautiful. This is generational parenting. This is how it was meant to happen. Because moms, dads, if we do this right, if we get this right, though we may not be around one day to hear them, our grandkids will thank us for it. They will thank us for it. Listen, let's be honest, the flip side's true as well. Some of us are dealing with some garbage and baggage and some of us have got some repetitive things going on in our families. And it come from grandma, it came from granddad, it came from great granddad and great grandma that got ingrained in their children and then their children's children. And all of a sudden it's just part of the family now. This cuts both ways. This is why we gotta do the hard work to do it right because the stakes are high. And if we lose sight of it, we'll forsake our duties. If we lose sight of it, we'll do something dumb and will wound and will scar our children, which chances might be that it will also wound and scar our grandchildren. So this is just not about our kids. This is about our grandkids. This is about a progeny of multiple generations. So he says, I want you to get wisdom. Get wisdom, develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom. She will protect you. Love her and she will guard you. This is vision. He's just not telling his kids how to act. He's teaching his kids how to think. That's more important. Teach your kids how to act, but teach them how to think. That's wisdom. Wisdom is learning how to think. Think through things from multiple directions. Think through something all the way. Anticipate outcomes. Play out scenarios. That's wisdom. Getting wisdom, he says, is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. Because again, your choices create your future. If you prize wisdom, she will make you, let's all say this together, great. Who, who, who aspires mediocrity for their children? Not a good parent. Not a good mom, not a good dad. Who wants to see their kids just do as good as what the parents have done? Not a good parent, in my opinion. We wanna see our kids do better. We wanna see our kids do greater things. And so he's, he's calling out for a vision of wisdom. He says, hey, wisdom's gonna to lead to good decisions. It's gonna create strong families. It's gonna create healthy friendships for you. Uh, with wisdom, you read through the Proverbs. I mean, this just goes on and on. With wisdom comes self-control. With wisdom comes physical health. With wisdom comes the skill to live life well. You know, wisdom gives you the ability to be balanced. You can go far and grow deep at the same time. You can be successful, but be significant at the same time. You can be blessed, but be grounded with gratitude at the same time. I mean, wisdom's this powerful thing and he's casting a compelling vision for be wise and this is what wisdom looks like. He says, my child, listen to me and do as I say and you will have a good long life because that's what every parent wants for their kid, a good long life. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions, don't let them go. Guard them for they are the key to your life. That's vision casting. Go further, go faster. And if you read through these other Proverbs when he's speaking, he's casting vision for all the areas of his kid's life. Every area. He says the way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they're stumbling over. And then he gets to the end. 
And he says, mark out straight paths. Find a good path, find a worthy target, find good examples, find godly examples, and go that direction. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path because there's a not so safe path. Don't get sidetracked because you can't get sidetracked. Don't get distracted. Keep your feet from following evil. And it's almost like you can hear the experience of the parent coming through. When he says, trust me, there's not a safe way. I've been on it. There's a dumb way. I've been on it. Son, don't get sidetracked by lesser things. Don't follow after the wrong thing despite how attractive or how alluring or how seductive it seems. This is like a parent saying, hey, learn from me. My successes and my failures. My successes and, listen, don't be afraid to share your failures with your children. They know you're not perfect. Exercise wisdom and when and how and all that, but let your children learn from the vast reservoir of both your successes and your failures. Listen, when you, when you open up the Proverbs, I, I, I challenge you, just the first 10 chapters, just start there. And notice how many of them begins with my children or my son, my children, my son, my children, my son, my daughter. J just see how many times it begins that way because it's a parent casting a vision for the future of children. And what you find is, there's a vision for them spiritually. There's a vision for them sexually. Hey, this is the type of marriage you should aspire for. These are the type of pitfalls that you should avoid. There's a vision for them relationally, to have healthy friendships and relationships because your friends predict your future. There, there's a vision for them financially about giving and serving and investing. There's a vision for them practically of working hard and celebrating well and being disciplined and learning how not to stay up too late and getting out of bed too late. I mean, it's practical and this, this vision, it's clear, it's compelling. I mean, when you're getting to the point where you're saying, hey, don't go to bed late and don't sleep in all day. It's like common sense, but hey, sometimes you need that vision. That's what you want. And you open up these pages of Proverbs and it's like the father, it's like a mother speaking to their children saying, this is the path. This is the target. This is the win. You see, far-sighted parenting, that's what it is. Yeah, is there stuff going on in the moment? Yes. Are there some needs for nearsighted parenting? Yes. But there's far-sighted parenting at work and this parent's casting a compelling vision. So let me just say this and wrapping it up. When you cast a vision for your children, don't cast a vision just concerning what you want your children to do. Cast a compelling vision about who you want your children to be. Cast a vision of success, yes, but cast a vision of a life of significance as well. Cast a vision so that they understand their God-given purpose. Help them understand the, dif the differences between, hey, you obtain what's difficult to obtain. Because that's what success is. Success is that you've worked hard, you've made some good investments, you were in the right place at the right time, you worked real hard, you obtained some things that most people aren't able to obtain. Fortune, fame, influence, whatever it is. You've done the hard work and you've gotten what is difficult to obtain, but just because you obtain what's difficult to obtain doesn't mean that you've truly laid your hands on what's most important in life. That's true riches. Inspire them to both because it's our responsibility to give our kids a compelling vision for their future. Based upon God's truth, centered around their individual bents. You can't force a kid, you can, but you shouldn't force a kid to go in a direction they were never intended or designed by God to go in. You just shouldn't. That's a disservice to them for the rest of their life. You do it based on God's word, centered around their individual bents, and seasoned with your own life experience because you can salt and pepper the vision in a way that nobody else can because you've lived and you know them, and because you've lived your life and you know them, you can speak a clear and compelling vision like nobody else can over your son and daughter. And let's be honest, there's a culture out there that's casting a vision over our children. There's competing visions for what the life of our children are supposed to look like. And nobody's vision stands to win out as much as the vision of a mother or a father spoken over the life of a son or daughter. One of the best things you can do 
for your child today is paint a compelling vision of their tomorrow. So, I got some homework for you and I wanna encourage you to do it. I hardly ever ask you to do anything really just quite like this. Shepard, I want you to come up here for just a moment while I do this. Um, here's some homework. This week, sometime this week, come here, buddy. Sometime this week, I want you to spend some time and I want you to write down your vision for your son or for your daughter or for your grandchildren. And it doesn't matter how old your son or daughter is. They, they may not even be at home anymore. You should still do this. And I want you to write this letter and then I want you to set them down and I want you to read it to them. And then I want you to give it to them. And I want you to encourage them to keep it. File it away somewhere where they know where it's gonna be at for years to come. And then update that letter regularly as needed. Here, here's what I wanna do today. I, I told Ash Shepherd's permission to do this. Have a seat there, buddy. I did this this week. I do this all the time. Um, it's just something I don't know. You can turn on around, bud. Just relax, you're good. You're good. Uh, this is something, I don't know. I, I read it a long time ago. And, and I thought, you know what I'm gonna do today? I want you to know I'm no different than you. I got all my insecurities, I got all my junk, I got all my failures, all my deficiencies. But at the end of the day, I'm a dad, I'm a parent, and I can do hard things. I can do things maybe I'm not even that good at. And I can sit down and I can type out and I can write out a vision for my children, especially when it's a matter of life and death. So, Shepard, since the day you were born, there's a couple of things I've told you consistently. The first is there's nothing that you could ever do that would ever make me love you more. And there's nothing that you could ever do or say that would ever make me love you less than I already do. The second thing I've told you since you were born is this. One day, you're gonna do great things. I remember when I drove you around our neighborhood in that little red rider wagon before you could remember it and telling you in words you couldn't understand that you were born to be great. I remember walking around carrying you in my arms, whispering in your ear that God had an amazing plan for your life and people would be the better because of your gift of life to the world. All these years later, I've never believed those words more than I do right now. Perhaps every dad feels this way. Maybe not, but there's no question that your dad feels this way. When I think about your future, it doesn't scare me. I know there's gonna be challenges and there's gonna be a lot of things that can happen, but still yet, when I allow myself to imagine your future, it brings me joy and excitement. When I think about how far you can go in life, what you could do, the success you could have, the significance your life could wield, and the sum total of good that could flow from your life, it makes my face smile and my heart overflow. God has been so good to you. Good looks, witty sense of humor, brilliant mind, a soft heart, a compassionate spirit, a resilient will, a charming personality, a strong code of loyalty, a consistent sense of gratitude, an ethic of honesty, all with a spirit of adventure. Things that are gonna serve you well throughout your life. Couple those things with an intellectually informed and an emotionally passionate faith. There's no limit to what God may choose to do in you and through you. Your position for a life of greatness and that means success and significance. I have no doubt that you're gonna obtain both. That's why I'm so excited. I look forward to the next few years and getting a front row seat with your mom to see you grow in your faith in your character, in your wisdom, and in your experiences. As you mature, I want you to listen to this one good. Be a pace setter. Don't merely be a member of the crowd, be a leader. Don't be a thermostat, be a thermometer. Don't be a thermometer rather, but be a thermostat. Don't be afraid to break away from the crowd when the crowd's wrong and you know what is right. Don't be afraid to speak up for those being left behind who have no one to speak up for them. And don't ever back down from a fight when you need to fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Don't ever do anything to intentionally hurt anybody. Always seek the greatest good of the people around you. Love never harms, it serves. Don't be quick to quit when things get hard. And I'm telling you, I promise you, things will get hard. 
because life's hard. Just remember, quitters never accomplish anything that resembles greatness. Work hard at whatever you're doing. If you're gonna do it, do the, be, be the best at it. Be disciplined so you can develop your competency and faith and school and life. Embrace the task of building your character. Character isn't the absence of failing, it's picking yourself up after you fail, and you will fail, but you learn from it, and you move forward. Don't settle for the lesser version of yourself, that's the easy thing to do. Strive to be the greatest version of who you can be, and write a better story with your life. Be confident, but not arrogant. Be humble, but not overly critical of yourself. Over the next few years, learn to say thank you a lot. Learn to say that you're sorry a lot. Learn to say those difficult words, I was wrong, forgive me. Learn to perhaps say the hardest words of all, I forgive you. People are gonna fail, you will fail. And what we need from others, don't withhold it from others when they need it from you, forgiveness. Don't hold on to hurts and to wrongs that, committed, that are committed against you. Don't be bitter and don't be resentful. It's too small of a life for you to live. Be adventurous, live life to the full. That's why Jesus came. Get good at celebrating life. Celebrate the big moments and celebrate the small ones. Don't ever forget that family and good friends make life good. When you consider a career path, seek what'll make a great living and what will also afford you the opportunity to make a great difference. Don't be content with being just a success. Help others succeed. Be generous because greedy people are never great people. Be grateful for everything God allows you to have and if you do that, you'll steward it better. So, a few last things. Fall in love. And when you do, I know she'll be beautiful, but make sure she's brilliant, carries herself with class, yet it's down to earth. Make sure she's funny and witty and strong with a little bit of mystery. And make sure most of all, she loves Jesus. Make sure she's got a strong sense of independence, yet leans on you when she needs you. Make sure she's fun, loves adventure, a bit unconventional, and on occasion loves a good verbal argument. Just keep it fresh and interesting. That's hard work. I could go on with qualities, but to make it short, just look for somebody like your mom. When you and your wife have kids one day, you're gonna know what I've known all these years. Being a dad's the greatest thing in the world. I can't wait till you and your brother bring your kids home to visit her for the holidays. I can see us cooking in the kitchen, telling stories, listening to music, and dodging the occasional kid running through the room. Those are gonna be great days. I pray the Lord brings them to pass. I have no doubt you're gonna be a great dad. Tell your kids you love them every day. Pray with them. Tell them they're gonna be great. Hand down the stories that have been handed down to you. Tell your kids your favorite stories about me and about your mom, about your grandparents and your great-grandparents. Stay loyal to your friends. Don't be afraid of hard work. And remember that no matter where life takes you, there's no place you can go and nothing you can do that God's grace can't keep you. Because as much as I love you, your heavenly Father loves you more. Don't take yourself too seriously. Loosen up and laugh on occasion. Be bold enough to tell the people that you love how you feel about them before you're robbed of the chance by death to do so. Surround yourself with great people, good people who love Jesus' life and who love you. Stay in shape, take care of yourself. Learn to save your money and invest it and be generous with it. Work hard and play hard too. Let your kids hear you pray. And one day take this letter and read it to your kids and then challenge them to read it to their kids. And then you write your own and you begin to hand it down. Live your life well, live it for God's glory. And one day when your life comes to an end, you'll be glad that you did. I love you. I know he didn't want to do that, but I'm glad that he did. Because I want you to know, you can do that. We can all do that. Because there's a promise that says, start children off in the way they should go. 
And when they're old, they won't turn from it. Or better yet, it won't turn from them. No matter what happens and where they go in life, what you put in, what you deposited, what you invested won't fade away. Heavenly Father, I pray you give us parents a compelling vision for the future of our sons and daughters. I pray that you'd give all of us moms and dads just enough courage to sit down sometime this week and put to words something that they can pass on in a tangible way, something that they read and let their kids hear it in their own voice, a compelling, worthy vision of what could be and what should be. Let us speak these blessings over our children's lives. Let us speak it in faith and speak it in prayer and pray that they catch the vision and one day live it out and cast their own in the generations to come. Let, it get, let us get it right, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand together and sing.